for tonight's tutorial, we'll be taking up the topic on separation of power for week four. We will have our makeup tutorial next week uh, for the week five topic on judicial powers. Now, I, I understand that next week is actually going to be a midterm break, but I realize that it might actually be difficult to kind of organize a makeup tutorial that's convenient for all. So I decided to just do it on Thursday of next week. And I hope that a lot of you will be able to join it, notwithstanding the fact that it is actually the midterm break. And for those of you who are able, who will be unable to do it, then you know you could always just uh, watch the the podcast or the recording of the tutorial. So tonight, uh, so going back to what I was trying to say earlier, for those of you who might want to who are joining the tutorial for the purpose of picking up marks for group discussion, it is imperative that you actually uh, participate in the discussion by picking up your mic and answering the uh, discussion question or contributing uh, your, your thoughts to whatever is being discussed because the mere participate mere attendance at a zoom tutorial will not lead to any points so having said that for tonight uh, at the, after this session you should be able to distinguish and explain the operation of separation of powers at the federal state levels explain the weakening of the division of powers between the legislature and the executive and the permissibility of vesting of quasi-legislative powers in the executive, explain the guardedness of the high court against any encroachment into federal judicial powers, and explain the concept of judicial power in relation to the high court's strong resistance against the vesting of non-judicial powers on chapter three courts. So this topic is crucial because part of it actually touches on the legal memorandum questions uh, that are there, uh, particularly in relation to what the, uh, what the federal parliament can do in relation to judicial powers and what it can do, and what state parliaments can do, again, in relation to state judicial powers, because the operation or the principle of separation of powers is vastly different uh, if you compare its operation at the federal level as opposed to the state level, they are not the same. So that is crucial, and we will try to see that in the course of tonight's tutorial. So on the one hand, while there is definitely a separation of power, at least a partial separation of powers at the federal level, there is no separation of powers uh, at the state level. And so therefore, as you will see later on, we will notice that while it may be per, while it is not permissible following the boilermakers case to vest non-judicial to vest non-judicial powers or administrative powers on uh, federal judges or federal courts that uh, act is permissible as far as state courts are concerned and we will see that in the course of some of the discussion questions tonight and i think we're covering about how many of them are those one two three, four, five, six, seven, eight. Okay, so we're going to try to go through them quickly. And if you can't, if you can't answer them all, I will still be providing the, um, the suggested answers anyway in Moodle. So let's begin, discussion question one. And so what we're gonna do, uh, we're, we're, we're just gonna go through this a bit quickly. And if I could, you know, I'll try to explain what is important. But hang on, I'm just gonna, because I'm using my mobile phone as well. I'm just going to plug it in in case I have a problem and run out of power. Hang on, disappear. Great. Okay. There. Okay. So let's begin with um, question one. PQR Enterprises seeks to appeal from a decision of the Business and Commercial Establishments Tribunal and Administrative Tribunal created by Parliament under the Business and Commercial Establishments Tribunal Act, Commonwealth. So it's obviously created by the Federal Parliament. Now, PQR seeks to ground its appeal on the fact that the Tribunal failed to follow the rules of natural justice by preventing it from presenting crucial evidence in its proceedings. As his or her solicitor, advice speak your enterprises on the matter. Can I get a volunteer? Volunteer. 
Hi, this is B, our volunteer. Yes, B, go ahead. Yes, thank you. Um, yes, I, I think that they they would be considered to be a court and therefore they Sorry, would I missed that. Sorry. Can you repeat that B? They would be considered a what? Yes, I, um, they, will con they will be considered to be a, a court exercising judicial uh, power and therefore they would have to um, exhibit this five procedural and structural characteristics of the review process, which includes mm -hmm. uh, natural justice. Um, there will be cases cited according to uh, RV, R and Trade Practices Tribunal, Rich and Baldwin, and Lease mm -hmm. and Commonwealth. Okay. Thank you, B. Can I get another answer? Thank you, B. I'll, I'll respond to your point in a short while. Thank you. Can I get another answer? So B had said that uh, this tribunal would be acting like a court and therefore it is required to observe the rules of natural justice, being a court. Can I get uh, another answer from someone else? Uh, Nick, yes, yes. Go ahead, Nick. Rajar, um, I would uh, I'd say that it's it, it can't act as a court given that it's created by the executive under that uh, act. Um, it's just having having read ahead to next week. Sorry, I was a bit confused. I thought we were talking about that this week, uh, and then it wouldn't be bound to follow natural justice. Sorry, I, there, there seems to be something wrong with my with my headphone. So, was it a court or not a court? I kind of missed that part. Sorry, I would I would uh, I would say that it, it wouldn't have to act as a court, given that it's it's created by an executive act. So it's working it's working under the under the executive, not as a not as a, a like a charge. Okay, right? let's yeah, let's just clarify because you said that it would be created under an executive act. You actually mean it's created by parliament. It is based on a statute. Although it seems to belong to the executive. Is that what you're saying? Because this is created by parliament. So it's yeah, based on statute. That's correct. Okay. So let me clarify again. So is this a court? I Meaning is it a chapter three court or is it an administrative tribunal? Or what's the distinction anyway, if there is one? No, I'd say it's an, an administrative tribunal. It, it, it's name that it's, it's created through an act of parliament, that it's not, not a chapter three court for the purpose of the, uh, of the constitution. Okay, so this isn't a chapter three court. In fact, as the facts clearly say, it is an administrative tribunal. Okay, now the fact that it is an administrative tribunal as opposed to being a chapter three court, what is its significance in relation to the rules of natural justice? They don't apply. Uh, the Janet? Way, but they don't apply the same way as what they do in a chapter three court. And it is based on merits and not questions of law. Okay. In relation to the question of natural justice, what is the distinction uh, between the way uh, chapter three courts would operate as opposed to administrative tribunals? Can I have a go? It's Sarah here. Uh, that will be Sarah. Sorry, sorry. Olsen. Olsen. Okay, uh, thank you, Sarah. Yeah. Um, I had that the difference was um, Chapter 3 courts have to be impartial and fair um, and that people have to have the opportunity to be heard um, and that tribunals make decisions according to the combination of legal and policy considerations, potentially. Okay, very good. So it's crucial for us to make a distinction. Thank you, Sarah, you're correct. It's crucial for us to make a distinction as to whether or not this tribunal is actually a court, a chapter three court, or whether or not it is an administrative tribunal. Because if it is a chapter three court, then necessarily it is required to observe the rules of natural justice. However, if it is an administrative tribunal, it is only required to observe the rules of natural justice if first, the statute creating it would so provide, or secondly, the uh, the decision of the uh, tribunal would relate to an action of the executive, for example, 
that infringes or interferes with the rights, liberties, or interests of a person. So in the event that the proceeding uh, before a tribunal does not involve an interference or the violation of the rights or interests or legitimate expectations of persons, then there is no requirement for the observance of rules of natural justice. So it's very crucial every time you look at this, you need to determine, uh, first of all, whether or not the, what is being created is actually a, an administrative tribunal, because then it is not a chapter three court, or whether or not it is a chapter three court, because then it is always required to observe the rules of natural justice and act judicially. Okay, any questions in relation to question one? None, so in, in re the answer would be that um, the, I would advise speaker enterprises uh, not to file an appeal because the tribunal being an administrative tribunal created part by parliament is not required to observe the rules of natural justice. And so therefore, if PQR enterprises will ground its appeal on the fact that uh, the tribunal failed to observe the rules of natural justice, uh, that ground will, 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 uh, will, will not be cogent enough because as an administrative tribunal, it is not required in the first place to observe the rules of natural justice in the absence of a statute which requires it to observe the rules of natural justice or in the absence of a showing that the rights, legitimate expectations or interests of PQR enterprises have been uh, interfered with by a, an act of the executive. Okay, let's go to question two. Under the Refugee Resolutions Act Commonwealth, some judges of the federal court were designated as eligible judges of the Refugee Ref Resolutions Tribunal with power to issue warrants for the indefinite detention of undesirable aliens and refugees. The act provides that the Attorney General and the Minister of Defense have mutual authority to make binding and conclusive designations of persons as undesirable aliens and refugees. So focus on the fact that they can make binding and conclusive designations. Now, Ms. EFG, who was detained under the Act, filed suit with the High Court, questioning the constitutionality of the Act, rule on the Act's constitutionality. Volunteers? What's the legal issue here? So you have judges of the federal court who are designated as eligible judges of an administrative tribunal. So there, that's the first, you know, that, that's the first factual issue. What is the legal question there? And the second part of this particular problem relates to the fact that the Attorney General and the Minister of Defense, who belong to the executive, can make binding and conclusive designations which are binding and conclusive upon the members of the tribunal, uh, which comprise judges of the federal court. So those are two aspects of the problem. Okay, so can I get a volunteer, some volunteers to answer this question, question two? Can I give it a go? This is justice. Yes, justice, go ahead, please. Yeah, I think uh, judges that, uh, um, um, that uh, the courts that are created under uh, uh, Chapter 3 cannot uh, perform non-judicial duties. So judges mm -hmm. that are elected under that uh, uh, chapter cannot really uh, uh, you know, participate in, in a, in a, in a uh, tribunal. Uh, and I also think that the Attorney General and the Minister for Defense cannot actually uh, make binding and conclusive designation because they are not uh, they they are not judges. Mm. Okay. Uh, I will respond to your point in a short while, and I'd like to flag two points that you mentioned, at least three points. One was that they were elected. Judges are not elected at all; they're appointed. Secondly, you cited the fact that um, 
judges of federal courts cannot perform non-judicial functions, which presumably follows the Boilermakers case. But the question that arises is whether or not that is, there is an exception to the Boilermakers case. And the third point you mentioned had something to do with the judges, which kind of missed, but I'll get back to that. Comments from, every, from anyone as to what uh, Justice had said. I've got a question, Manjo. Uh, yes, Janet. Yeah. Um, in regard to the judicial power of the persona designata, I wondered whether it would come under this, looking at what was said in Hilton and Wells, mm -hmm. where, where the power is conferred on a judge rather than on a court. It yes. would be a question. It will be a question. It, it is, will be a question whether the reference to judge rather than to court indicates mm. that the power was intended to be vested in the judge as an individual who, because mm. the judge possesses the necessary qualifications to exercise it. That's right. You're, you're headed in the right direction, Janet. So if you were to connect Hilton versus Wells to the uh, facts of discussion question two, what then would part of your answer be? So we have the Boilermakers case, which clearly says that uh, Chapter 3 courts cannot be vested with non-judicial functions. And at the same time, the Boilermakers case pointed out that judicial powers cannot be vested in a non-Chapter 3 court. So that's according to the Boilermakers case. Those are the two key doctrines. However, you cited Hilton versus Wells. Can you relate that case to the case facts in discussion question two? Well, just generally, um, that if the functions are ex exercised by an eligible judge, if mm. they are non-judicial, then the decisions would generally not be appealable to the High Court under Section 23 of the Constitution. Mm. That then would suggest that it's not something that is constitutional. <laughs> mm, okay, uh, I'm just gonna help you out a bit here. So as uh, Janet correctly pointed out, there is an exception to the Boilermakers doctrine, and that is that under the persona designata doctrine, uh, as uh, formulated in the case of Drake versus Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, as well as Hilton versus Wells, it is permissible for chapter three judges, not the court, chapter three judges in their personal capacity to be vested with non-judicial powers for as long as they consent to that designation. So in this case, it is permissible, therefore, for judges of federal courts in their personal capacity to belong to administrative tribunals or non-chapter three courts. So that's permissible. But there is a corollary rule that has also been, has, that has also been uh, stated in Hilton versus Wells concerning incompatibility. Can somebody help me out on this one? What is this rule about incompatibility that arises from the case of Drake versus Minister for Immigration and Ethnic Affairs, as well as Hilton versus Wells? Yeah, well, I'll have a go, Tiffany. Uh, who would that be? Tiffany. Sorry, I, I could hardly hear you. It's Tiffany Wilkins. Tiffany, yes. Tiffany um, Wilkins, would that be it? Yeah, I thought that they Thank said you. that um, the judge can exercise those non-judicial powers as long as they're showing the ind their independence from the executive and they're not mm. going to question the independence of the judiciary. Yes. <laughs> okay, you're headed in the right direction. Now, connect it to the facts. So under the facts, it says that the Attorney General and the Minister of Defence make binding and conclusive designations of persons, binding upon members of the tribunal. How does that relate to the question of independence of the federal judges sitting as uh, eligible judges of the tribunal? Tiffany, would you like to go on? Um. So with this particular question, like how it relates? Yeah. In general. 
Um, Sorry, what was it? Yeah. I don't know. I don't know. I'm a little bit stuck with it. I don't. I don't know. I was waiting for your answer to be honest. Okay. So, again, as a reminder, as a reminder, it is crucial that, especially the legal memorandum, and even you know when you try to answer discussion questions, and in relation as well to the final assessment. It is crucial for you not just for you to state the principles for the law. You need to be able to apply the law and the principles to the case facts. And in this case, part of the case facts indicate that the general, that the attorney general and the minister of defense can make binding and conclusive designations. It means that the eligible judges, the federal judges, really have little say, especially when a designation has been made by the attorney general. Now, that kind of binding and conclusive designation raises the question of whether or not these judges are actually independent when they exercise their functions as members of the administrative tribunal. And in all likelihood, they are not independent because they, they have to kind of rubber stamp, they, they have to consent to whatever is designated by the attorney, attorney general and the Minister of Defense. So therefore, they lack the independence to make an independent judgment concerning this specific law. And because of that, their functions actually become incompatible as members of Chapter 3 courts. So the answer would be that the act is likely going to be unconstitutional. So on the one hand, while uh, it is permissible under uh, Drake versus Minister of Immigration, Aster, as well as Silton versus Wells, for a Chapter 3 judge to be vested with non-judicial powers in his personal capacity for as long as he consents, that vesting of non-judicial functions must be compatible with the role of the federal judge as a member of a Chapter 3 court. So where there is no longer any independence that could be exercised by a Chapter 3 judge as a member of an administrative, tri of an administrative tribunal, that designation would therefore be uh, invalid. So the answer here is the act would be unconstitutional because the function of a Chapter 3 judge as a member of the tribunal uh, is not compatible is not compatible with the role of a chap of a Chapter 3 judge as one with independence. Now, discussion question three: The Attorney General has invited three senior members of the Federal Court of Australia to act as advisors to the Attorney General's Department in the discharge of its national security responsibilities. In particular, such consenting senior members shall provide advice to the Attorney General's Department on the legality of its operational guidelines and procedures, determining the validity of such designation. Volunteers? Give it a go. Because I, I often think that, you know, the more you participate, engage in the discussion questions, the better is your understanding and you will be in a better position to remember what was discussed instead of just passively listening to what others are discussing because you are forced to engage with the subject matter. And as I said, you know, feel free to make a mistake because that's the whole purpose of the tutorial. We can learn from each other's, you know, correct answers as well as from our own mistakes. Okay, I'll, I'll have a go <laughs> to Janet, make yes. a mistake. Thank you, Janet. Yes. Um, it would seem to me, um, just from my limited understanding of it, that in providing advice, it almost goes against, again, the Chapter 3 courts, which primarily are there to make comment on an on cases that are limited to Chapter 3 courts with their independence and that by doing something like this, it's preempting a legislation. It's feeding into it, if you like, in a consultative process. And I would have thought there would have been a little bit of a conflict of interest there. Mm. Okay. Comments on the, from the rest of the class? Uh, this is justice again. Justice, yes. Uh, I think this is another case of persona de signata. Um, yes, go on. Because uh, the judges are consenting, and yes, and I think that uh, there's no really 
uh, in compatibility here or it is very mm. remote? Very good. So that's the correct answer there, uh, what ju Justice pointed out. So there are two aspects to this. What we need to remember is, number one, is that according to the Boilermakers case, as I earlier said, a, uh, the, high, the High Court has clearly ruled that it is not permissible for Parliament to vest uh, Chapter 3 judges, I mean a Chapter 3 court, with non-judicial powers. So had this designation been upon the court itself, had Parliament vested the Federal Court of Australia itself, not its members, had the, the Parliament vested the Federal Court of Australia with non-judicial powers, as in this case, because they act as advisor, that is not in a judicial power, it would have been invalid. Okay, but because the designation is upon members of the federal court in their personal capacity and with their consent, and as Justice pointed out, Justice pointed out, there doesn't seem to be an, an incompatibility between their role as members of the federal court as well as their designation as members of the Attorney General's department. Then, following Hilton versus Wells and Drake versus Minister of Immigration, and under the persona designated doctrine, such a uh, an appointment would be valid okay now what we also need to remember and i i'm not sure if we're covering it this week or next week is that what we need to remember is that the reason why the boilermakers case uh emphasized the requirement that um chapter three courts cannot be vested with non-judicial powers is because under Article 73 and Article 75 of the Australian Constitution, the, the power of the High Court uh, can only be raised in relation to a matter. So when we speak of a matter, therefore, it means that there is an actual controversy before the court that involves uh, a right, an interest, or a legitimate expectation uh, that has been interfered or violated uh, between the state and its citizens or between citizens. In this case, there is no actual controversy because the, the, the function of the members of the uh, federal court would actually be to act as advisors. So in that regard, that is not a judicial function because it does not involve a matter. It is simply hypothetical. So had the, had the designation been upon the court itself, it would clearly have been invalid according to the case of uh, the Moilermakers case. But because this involves a the application of the persona designated doctrine, then this designation of uh, members of the federal court as advisors to the Attorney General's department would be valid under the persona designated doctrine, both because it is in their personal capacity, it is with their consent, and finally, their uh, functions uh, as advisors to the Attorney General's department would be compatible with their membership in a Chapter 3 court. Uh, can I yes. ask a question, question about me. the SSP? Yeah, I, I'm just wondering how is this different from the case of Wilson, where this judge was supposed to make report to the uh, make a report to the Attorney General, and that was ruled as uh, not not permissible. That's right. So the main difference is that. In the case of uh, Wilson versus uh, Minister for Aboriginal Affairs and Torres Strait Islanders Affairs, is that the uh, the designation of the of a judge of the federal court in making the report was actually subject to the control of the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs. So, if the Minister for Aboriginal Affairs said that he had to change the report or that he could not publish the report, then he had to obey what the Minister for uh, Aboriginal Affairs uh, said. In that case, therefore, there was no independence on the part of the federal judge preparing the report. He was subject to the control of the uh, Minister for uh, Aboriginal Affairs. Whereas here, in, so in the, case of Mr., uh, in the case of Wilson versus Minister for Aboriginal Affairs, there was absent uh, an aspect of independence of the federal judge in preparing the report because he was subject to the control of the minister. Whereas in the example we have here in discussion question three, there is nothing that indicates that, uh, the, that the members of the federal court are not independent. 
Okay, so that's the crucial point there. Thank you, B, for asking that question. Now, discussion question four, Parliament seeks to pass a law whereby the assets and properties of an organization designated by the Minister of Defense as, ter as terrorist or a criminal syndicate shall be forfeited and seized by the government. Hang on. Okay, so we assume this is a federal law. Okay, now under the law, a designation by the Minister of Defense shall be conclusive and not subject to judicial review. Rule on the constitutionality of the proposed law. Can I mean, Scott Wilburn here? Yes, Scott. Um, I think that would be un unconstitutional because it's, it's uh, establishing judicial power on the Minister of Defence. Um, it's, it's a controversy involving uh, rights uh, to property. Uh, he's giving a binding and authoritative decision which is, which, they, which is conclusive and not subject to judicial review. Uh, so the only authority that could, that power has to be uh, given to a Chapter 3 court. And he's, he's not a Chapter 3 court. Mm. Okay. Thank you, Scott. Can I hear another answer? Can I be heavily inspired by the castle and talk about uh, uh, what are we in section uh, section fifty one that it would need to be made on just terms the acquisition of property sorry to sound like Dennis Denuto mm. um, but uh, yeah I think uh, I, I would need to find some authority to say that a uh, arbitrary decision by a executive officer to seize property or to designate uh, property as, as coming from a terrorist or criminal syndicate organisation uh, would, uh, would fail the justice test. Uh, yes, Janet, it is being uh, recorded. Okay, I got your point, Nick, about uh, the question about just terms. Okay, any other answers? Uh, yes, I think, it, I, I, I'm wondering if this question is about the Hick, Hickman conditions uh, in mm -hmm. this case, the Hickman conditions, they actually upheld the validity of the law subject to three conditions, that it was a bona fide attempt to do something. It was um, within the, uh, sub it's related to a subject matter of the legislation and the decision was reasonably capable of reference to those powers. Uh, and they considered this to be a privative rather than an ouster clause because they they just, uh, the court ruled that they could still appeal on the basis of jurisdictional error. Okay, so that was the answer I was waiting for, the answer provided by B. There are actually two, thank you very much B, there are actually two parts to this question. The first question, uh, which was touched upon by Scott, uh, raised the question of whether or not the designation by parliament uh, and providing the, the Minister of Defense the power to designate an organization as being terrorist or criminal syndicate, whether that actually involved the vesting of judicial power. So that's the first question that needs to be answered. Okay, whether or not that constitutes the vesting of judicial power. And the second question is whether or not uh, the fact that the designation by the Minister of Defense is conclusive and not subject to judicial review actually means that that is an ouster clause as opposed to a privative clause. So, what I'm flagging here, again, is that when you examine a discussion question, you need to be able to tease out what the legal questions involved are. Okay? So I, I flagged two uh, legal questions there. So the first legal question is whether or not this designation involved the vesting of judicial powers and whether or not, two, the designation actually uh, constitutes an ouster clause or a privative clause. Now, going back to that first question, this is unlikely to be the vesting of a judicial power because uh, the vesting of judicial powers means that a, a body or a judge or a person uh, is given the authority to make a judgment based on an actual controversy between, citizen, between the citizen and the state or between citizens. In this case, there is no actual controversy. There isn't a matter because what, is, what simply happens is that the Minister of Defense makes a designation. There is no controversy. There is no actual controversy, not in the legal context. 
mean, in a layman's term, we might say that there's a controversy, but in looking at it from the viewpoint of what matter, the word, the concept of matter means uh, from the viewpoint of constitutional law, there is no actual controversy between citizens or between the, the state and the citizen. So there is no matter. So therefore, what happens here is that there is no vesting of judicial power. On the other hand, what is involved is in fact uh, an administrative power that has been vested upon uh, the Minister of Defense. So there is no violation uh, concerning the non-vesting of judicial powers on a non-Chapter 3 court. Now the second question though, as pointed out by uh, B, following the Hickman case, is whether or not the designation by the Minister of Defense uh, of a, an organization as being a terrorist or a criminal syndicate, uh, being it being conclusive and not subject to, to judicial review, constitutes a privative clause or an ouster clause. Because the rule is that if the clause is an ouster clause, meaning it totally prevents a Chapter 3 court from reviewing the legality or, or, uh, leg the, or constitutionality of a law or an action of the executive, so if it's an outside clause, that would be impermissible and the law would therefore be invalid. However, if it is a privative clause in the sense that it only provides some restrictions on the power of judicial review, that restriction uh, provided by parliament would be valid. Now, the other basic rule is that as much as possible, when there is a restriction on the power of judicial review, such a restriction must, as far as possible, be viewed as a privative clause and not as an ouster clause. Now, in this case, it can be argued that uh, what has simply happened is that there is a restriction on the power of judicial review because there is no statement here that the High Court, for example, uh, has been uh, prevented from exercising its power under Article 75 uh, of, of the Australian Constitution uh, to uh, issue writs of anomalous prohibition or injunction in relation, for example, to uh, officers of the Commonwealth. So if you read this therefore as a privative clause, and it should be read as a privative clause, then such a designation would be constitutional and therefore the proposed law would be valid. Questions? Okay, so how many questions uh, do we have? Like yes, yes. Okay, so this is where I got really confused, like when it came to these privative clauses, because yes. even though like it's not an ouster and it's just restrictions, isn't that still an encroachment on the separation of powers either way? That, because they're still trying to have an effect of telling the judiciary how they can exercise their powers. I know they're not saying you can't exercise them, but they're still restricting them. So isn't that kind of the same thing? That's right. Not exactly, because if you examine Article 73 of the Australian Commonwealth Constitution, it does provide that the Parliament has the power to determine uh, the, the powers of a Chapter 3 court under Article 73. So it is up to the Parliament actually to prescribe the jurisdiction of courts. So if uh, Parliament decides that to limit the uh, jurisdiction of a Chapter 3 court, such as a federal court, that is valid according to the Constitution itself. Now, it would be invalid, however, if the, it becomes an ouster clause in the sense that uh, a law, for example, would say that there is no court in Australia that has the power to issue writs of mandamus, prohibition, and injunction, because that would be contrary to Article 75. So, therefore, we need to, to read the Constitution, the different constitutional provisions. So, we read Article 75 in relation to Article 73. And Article 73, as I pointed out, clearly provides that the Parliament has the power to prescribe the jurisdiction of uh, federal courts. Uh, thank you for the question, Tiffany. Now, discussion question five. The Queensland Parliament passed the Motorized Criminal Syndicates Act, Queensland, so this is a state legislation, that vested on the Queensland Political Tribunal a power based on strict criteria and guidelines to designate certain organizations as motorized criminal syndicates engaged in serious crimes and issue an order for the seizure of their assets. Under the act, the decisions of the tribunal were final 
and not appealable to the Queensland Supreme Court or the High Court. Rule of the Act's validity. Good evening, Mean Joe, everybody. Robert Crop here. I might have a dig at this one if Robert, that's all right. Yes, yes, please. This one is similar apart from the fact, unlike the previous one, this is a state case, as you pointed out. Mm. Uh, while state constitutions don't specifically create a separation of powers, mm -hmm. the High Court did find that Section 71 and 73 provide the extension of Commonwealth state of separation principles to the states and mm. through Kirk and the Industrial Court of New South Wales, uh, the state parliament cannot simply legislate away the review capabilities of the Supreme Court or the High Court. Very good. Uh, you've only partly answered the question, but that very good, Robert. Thank you. Any other answers? So Robert was actually pointing to what is known as the autochthonous doctrine. And we're going to go back to that in a short while. Can I just get another answer? Another answer from anyone? Yeah, Mando, uh, Scott Wellburn again. Would it Scott, be because, yes. yep, is this uh, Forge and Australian Securities Investments Commission where they, they're depriving a state Supreme Court of its supervisor, supervisory jurisdiction and therefore creating islands of power immune from supervision and restraint? Mm hmm. Uh, partly. Yes. Okay. That's all what, are the, what, what are the two legal questions here, really? What are the two legal questions that are raised by this specific discussion question? Well, the, the uh, two would be can they designate these organizations as motorized criminal syndicates? Okay. Then, uh, so, what exactly does that mean? Is that the vesting of judicial or non judicial power? That, that would be a non-judicial power. And okay, it's good. Perfect, Very perfectly good. valid. It's per, like, it's like a police power and it's perfectly yes. valid. Um, ah, okay, so, so the first question is, is it permissible for the Queensland Parliament to vest non-judicial power on a... Oh, this is in fact a tribunal. So that's the first question there. It's perfectly, it's perfectly valid, in fact, it's even valid for the Commonwealth Parliament to vest non-judicial power on an administrative tribunal. So that's not the problem there. The second question then is whether or not this designation, uh, you know, the, the powers that have been vested to the tribunal actually uh, constitutes a privative clause or an ouster clause. That's the second question. And so what was the answer there? Should this be read as a privative clause or as an ouster clause? And how does that relate to the autochthonous doctrine that was cited both by Robert as well as Scott? Well, I think this is an attempt at an ouster clause because it specifically singles out both the Queensland Supreme Court and the High Court. Okay, that's one way of looking at it. But is it possible for you to make an argument that this is merely a privative clause? Uh, well, if you follow from the previous questions, they say all these causes are always to be read narrowly or read down. Mm -hmm. uh, and therefore, I think what I said in the previous questions was it would still apply. Um, okay. Very good, B. So we always have to go back to that point under the Hickman's doctrine that as much as possible, when Parliament seeks to limit, whether the, the state or the Commonwealth Parliament seeks to limit the power of judicial review of a court, it must sought to be interpreted, firstly, as a privative clause, meaning it simply provides restrictions on the power of judicial review, not that the uh, court itself has been ousted of its complete jurisdiction. So what we will notice here is that, the, is that the decision of the tribunal is final and not appealable. But really, when you look at it, an appeal is only one of the applications that can be made out after a judgment has been made. It does not deprive, for example, the power of the High Court to issue a writ of mandamus prohibition or injunction. So while an appeal may not be available under the Act, nothing would prevent the High Court 
under Article 75 of the Constitution when there is a matter to issue rates of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction. So to that extent, therefore, we can see that the jurisdiction of the High Court has not been ousted. Yes, there is no appeal, but the High Court can still intervene by issuing a rate of mandamus, prohibition, or injunction in a proper case. Okay, and because of that, if you can read this as a privative clause, as it should be, then the designation would be valid. Now, going back to what has been cited both by Robert uh, as well as Scott about the autochthonous doctrine, that is correct, that even uh, state courts, although they are actually creations of the state and therefore subject to the control of state parliaments, so in other words, it is permissible for state parliaments to vest non judicial powers on state courts because the separation of powers does not exist in states. So unlike the federal courts, which cannot be vested with non-judicial powers, state courts can permissibly be vested by state parliaments with non-judicial powers. Okay, so there is no question there. However, under the autochthonous doctrine, because state courts actually are part of an integrated federal court system, although they may be creation of the, of the state, they are still part of the federal court system still, of an integrated Australian court system. And to such an extent, under the autochthonous doctrine, therefore, it is impermissible, for example, one, for a state parliament to totally remove a high court, a, a Supreme Court. So it cannot uh, abolish a state court, and neither will it be permissible for a state parliament to vest certain powers uh, on a state court that would be contrary to its independence as a court and as part of an integrated federal court system. So there is a limitation uh, on what the state parliament can do. Okay, clear? Okay, let's move on. Discussion question six. Although the High Court in Cable uh, versus Director of Public Prosecutions and Vardon versus Attorney General considered state legislation that had strong similarities. The court arrived at two divergent decisions. Give an explanation for this divergence. Volunteers? I'll have a go at this one as well. Robert, yes. Uh, cable was directed against an individual as opposed to Farden, which was the it was left to the discretion of the court as a, mm. rather than a uh, ad hominem legislative judgment. Very good. Table. Very good. Okay. So did everyone get that? Robert correctly uh, ans gave the answer. So in the case of uh, Fardon, uh, the case of Cable versus Director of Public Prosecutions, what was involved is an ad hominem designation of a specific person, in this case Cable, uh, who had been uh, convicted of mass slaughter of his wife. So it was specifically, it was ad hominem towards Cable, and the designation uh, was binding. So even in the absence of evidence that Cable was uh, likely to, so there was no evidence that Cable would likely commit another crime. So the absence of uh, evidence, the, the High Court ruled that that was unconstitutional because a, a, a court uh, can, can only uh, provide punishment on the basis of evidence. In the case of Fardon, on the other hand, it's across a broad class of persons who can commit criminal acts. It's not ad hominem towards a specific person. And any such designation uh, must be based on evidence as uh, examined by a court. So that, that would at least be uh, two of the main distinction there, uh, which would distinguish the, the decision in Cable as opposed to that in Fardon. So thank you, Robert. Okay, discussion question seven. The New South Wales Parliament passed a law amending the New South Wales Court of Appeal Act, NSW. Under the amendment, the New South Wales Attorney General could appoint judges to the New South Wales Court of Appeal for a fixed term of two years, renewable thereafter for two to four years at his or her discretion. Rule on the validity of such an amendment. Volunteers.
Volunteers? I don't want to answer three in a row. I want to give someone else a go. Um, I believe Scott mentioned Forge uh, and ASIC earlier on. Yeah. Uh, I'm getting the right case. Uh, yes, I believe it would be valid. Uh, mm -hmm. Yes, it was in Forge. The High Court warned that while it was not unconstitutional to appoint a judge for an interim term, uh, that yeah, its overuse could erode confidence in both the Parliament and the courts. Mm -hmm. And basically the High yeah, I think it was Aboriginal Legal Services and Bradley. Um, the High Court said an acting appointment could extensive a series of acting appointments could extensively distort the character of the court, and I do not believe the High Court would allow it to go on for too long. So, was the amendment valid or not? I believe it is. There's nothing unconstitutional uh -huh. about having a a judge for a fixed term. It, they can only be removed the same way as a you know, before the end of their term in the same way as a normal judge. Okay. Um, I'm, I'm not convinced oh. of the reasoning there. Well, but you're I, correct. I, the answer was correct, but I found some of the reasoning um, questionable. Yes, V. Well, thank you, Robert. You're, you're actually on the right track. Yes, V. I, I think I didn't, wasn't very sure whether you would consider the New South Wales Court of Appeal as part of the Supreme Court of the state or not, because if it is, then uh, wouldn't that, it, it, I didn't know, it, it's not a Chapter 3 court, presumably it's not a Chapter 3 court, and therefore it does not have to be constituted according to the requirements of Chapter 3. Is that the very sort good. of answer you want to give? Yes. But I mean, why make a distinction as to whether or not the New South Wales Court of Appeal is a Supreme Court? Does it, does it matter? Oh, it doesn't matter. Uh, well, because the Supreme Court is a Chapter 3 court. And then it's, it wouldn't is matter. A, is a su state Supreme Court a Chapter 3 court or not? So we go back to that. Let's answer that basic question first. There seems to be a question here. Are state supreme courts chapter three courts? Banjo, it's Tiffany. Can I ask a question Tiffany. on this? It's got me like really confused. Okay. So, from my understanding, the state courts, they don't have to follow the separation of powers and they can have administrative functions and powers because they're made under state legislation. That's so right. They're Okay, but then we've mentioned, and it like even in the readings, that yes. because it's all integrated, therefore they do have to follow the same separation of powers. Like that's the bit I'm a bit confused with. They do okay. or they don't. Okay, so let, 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 let me answer that question. In the first place, um, Supreme Court, so state Supreme Courts, or any state court, they are not chapter three courts. Okay, so they have not been created according to the Australian Commonwealth Constitution. State Supreme Courts and state courts, one, either may have preceded the formation of the Australian Constitution, because remember that this, before the Federation was established, the, the, the states were acting as colonies, which had the same powers as Imperial England. So there were state courts that preceded the uh, development of uh, the development of uh, the constitution itself. So state courts uh, actually preceded the development of the constitution. So they were not created on the basis of the Australian constitution. They had already been founded then. Now, in some cases, um, because of the absence of a separation of powers in states, and because of the supremacy of state parliaments, it is actually within the power of state parliaments to create supreme courts or make changes uh, as to the composition of state courts or even issues about tenure and issues about remuneration because state courts are not 
chapter three courts. So whether you're speaking of a state Supreme Court or a state court of appeal, because these are state courts, they are not chapter three courts and are within the, I, I was about to say absolute control, but to a great extent are within uh, the control of a state parliament. Okay, so that's the, the basic rule there. However, following the uh, autochthonous doctrine, state courts, however, belong to an integrated federal court system in Australia. So which means, therefore, that although state courts being creations or creatures of state parliaments uh, may actually, uh, and, and you don't follow the separation of powers in states, so even though state supreme courts are to a great extent subject to the control of state parliaments, because of the autochthonous doctrine, there is in fact a limitation on the power of states uh, to do what it wishes in relation to state courts. Where the actions of state parliaments as they affect state courts would mean that state courts lose their independence, that would then violate the autochthonous doctrine and would then be impermissible. Or two, where state parliaments sought to abolish a, a superior court in a state, that would also violate the autochthonous doctrine because states cannot remove, according to the constitution, cannot remove the, 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 the existence of a state supreme court, which has the power of review over decisions of inferior courts in a state. Now, let me just see there is a chat here, hang on. Uh, I can't see the chat. It's missing. Uh, okay. Oh, it's from Sarah. Okay, so uh, that's fine. Any questions? Uh, thank, thank you, Sarah. None? Okay, we're going to go to the final question now. So thank you. That was clear? Okay, good. Hi, Matt. So, can I just yes. ask you, please? Yes, Janet. <laughs> I heard that the Supreme Courts are actually, the state Supreme Courts are Chapter 3 Courts. Would you say that's a correct answer or not? No, there, that wouldn't be a correct answer. So some of the uh, websites that list uh, a full list of Chapter 3 Courts, and for example, they say the Supreme Court of Queensland is a Chapter 3 Court. Is that then incorrect? That would be incorrect. Interesting. Yeah. So we have to be careful about websites. Um, it could be this that they would say... Australian Parliament one. Uh, I wouldn't know about that. So mm -hmm. what is... Uh, the, the crucial point here is that a Chapter 3 court is a court that is uh, created according to Chapter 3 of the Constitution. Now, a state Supreme Court is not created uh, according to Chapter 3 of the Constitution, both one, because... They were they preceded the creation preceded the establishment yeah. of the, the Australian Commonwealth. And, yeah, I get that. Uh, yes, and secondly, I understand it, that it's once federation came in, I thought yes. they then moved towards uh, the, being constitutional. In terms they wouldn't of be chapter three order. courts. No, they wouldn't be chapter three courts. Okay. But it'd be interesting for you to send me that link so I could just have a look at it. But I want to be clear. State Supreme Courts are not Chapter 3 Courts. So there is no requirement, for example, as to tenure, no requirement uh, as to uh, remuneration. In other words, it is up to state parliaments to limit uh, tenure, for example, if they decide that uh, judges can only, uh, judges of state courts can only uh, serve their role for a period of, let's say, seven years, that would be valid. On the other hand, that would be invalid if it pertains to a Chapter 3 Court because, um, Judges uh, in federal courts are meant to serve up to the age of 70 uh, for, 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 for the term. It cannot be for a fixed term only. Okay, now discussion question eight. It's 701, and I hope there's still some of you there. The South Australian Parliament passed a law under which any judge of a South Australia court must issue warrants of arrest, search, and seizure on the basis of a determination by the South Australian Minister of Justice rule on the validity of the law. Volunteers. Can I get a volunteer? 
So what is actually happening here is that the South Australian Parliament vested uh, certain powers on the South Australian Minister of Justice. Is that vesting, does that vesting involve uh, the exercise of judicial power or not? And assuming if it did involve the exercise of judicial power, would that be valid or not? So two questions there. What do you think? Um, well, this is B. Just in the interest of time, I'll give it a go. Um, this, uh, I think, the vesting is valid. There's no separation. There's an administrative function uh, or executive mm. function. There's no um, issue because there's no separation of power in the state. Uh, the yes. only problem is about the judge. Um, yes. The judge uh, under the state parliament, they can, they should be able to vest a judge with this. Uh, require a judge. It seems mm. to somehow cur curtail the independence of the judge. Uh, mm. In a federal court, that would not be allowed. In a federal court, that uh, it would be unconstitutional for for parliament, federal parliament, to. Uh, to say that a judge must issue a uh, warrants of search and arrest um, in the state parliament, uh, presumably they can, unless you think that it's going to impair the credibility of the of the court, which is actually part of the fed has got federal powers invested in it. Yes. That's the part that I'm not sure. Very good, about. very good. B. So give me your answer. You've given the correct principles. Apply the principles and your knowledge of the law now to the case facts. Uh, the, Tell first me, part me. Is, the first part is valid. The South Australian Parliament can vest the Minister of Justice, um, okay. give him the power to uh, determine whether uh, to seize or search someone's uh, property. Uh, mm. The second part, I have, I, 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 I'm not very sure. I think. Tell uh, me. Yes, <laughs> I suppose I have to say yes. <laughs> I think okay. it's that it's valid <laughs> as long You're as headed. it doesn't, uh, doesn't undermine. <laughs> I don't know. As do, long you as think, it do you think that the, the power of the South Australian Minister of Justice to require a judge to issue a warrant of arrest on the basis of his sole determination would that? interfere with the independence of a state judge and would that put into disrepute or question the independence of a state court which is part of an integrated australian federal system under the autochthonous doctrine that's the second question you need to answer if you put it that way then uh okay then it's not valid because it would undermine the uh, credibility it would be and, and, yes yeah. so that would be invalid because although it is permissible to you know um vest non-judicial powers on state courts under the case facts the uh a state judge does the bidding of a south australian executive and therefore it just rubber stamps the decisions or actions of the executive in that case therefore there is no independence on the on the part of the judge and that therefore undermines the independence and credibility of a state court which is not permissible under the autochthonous doctrine because even state courts even though they may be creations of the state and even though they may be subject to a lot of control by the state parliaments state courts still are part of this integrated australian federal system and under the autochthonous doctrine, it's crucial that the independence of state courts uh, must continue to be observed. Okay, so I guess that's it. Do you have any questions before we end tonight's tutorial? Yeah, Manjay, Scott Welburn, just in relation oh, yes. to the question eight, if it yes. was worded different, different and said uh, any judge may issue warrants of arrest, would, would that law then be valid? because it allows yes. the judge to make a determination based on the evidence. But because it says... The must, answer would be yes. You're correct, right. Scott. The answer would be yes. Because it, it uh, passes the two requirements. One is there is nothing, un, there is nothing impermissible uh, with a state judge being vested with non-judicial power. In that case, uh, when a South Australian judge, for example, issues a warrant of arrest, 
or search or seizure that is an, a non-judicial power because there is no actual controversy, but because it's a state uh, judge, uh, that is permissible. It doesn't violate the rule on um, the Boilermaker's case. And as to your second point, because if, if the facts had been that it was within the power of the judge to issue it or not, so it's not a requirement. Therefore, the judge, a state, a state judge, therefore, is functioning independently of the determination by the South Australian Minister of Justice. So if there is that level of independence, then there would be uh, no violation of the autochthonous, there would be no contravention of the autochthonous doctrine. Thank you for pointing out. That was very good. Questions before we end tonight's session? Um, will there be a tutorial on the legal memorandum assessment? Um, what I intend to do, we could either have a tutorial or I could do a lectured podcast. What do you think is preferable? Tutorial. Abhi, I, I couldn't tell you. Huh? Tutorial. Yeah, tutorial, so we can tutorial. ask questions. Okay. Okay, that's fine. Um, so I will schedule a tutorial, not next week, but the week after. We're going to have to do it perhaps on a Tuesday or you know, one, or some other day other than Thursday. Yeah, so I was thinking of doing a lecture podcast, but perhaps a tutorial will be better because you can, then you can ask questions. So we will schedule a tutorial, not next week, but the week after, where you know, we'll, we will go through the legal memorandum and then you can ask questions. Not that I will answer the questions themselves, but I will at least provide some guidance. Okay, so thank you very much, everyone. I'm very happy with the kind of engagement that we had, and uh, I hope we learned something here. I hope to see you again on Thursday. Have a great day. Thank you. Bye. Thank you.